but this needs to be carefully needs a careful layout of the systems. And the other step is that a system itself is running on multiple cores. But this needs to be program hard programmed for every system. So for example for the phys physics system we did this that um, the entity is are, are split up into smaller groups and then handled on multiple cores and then the result is, is merged back together. Um, but for other systems we did not do this yet. Or it's hard to do because it's not like a collision detection which you can do parallelize really easily. It's more like if it's a more complicated task it's not that easy to parallelize. That's the rough introduction into this topic. Yeah, I have the uh, graph up on Twitch now. If you want to take a look at that, maybe we can uh, step through that a little bit and discuss some of these uh, these these systems in, in progress. And so um, if you're watching on Twitch, I think my audio is working on Twitch, but I'm not 100% sure. I'm just going to change my OBS a little bit here. Let's see. It looks like, okay, it looks like people, I might be a bit loud. If anybody wants to like, just check out Twitch and make sure everything's working all right. Uh... Do, 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 do. Okay, cool. So um, right now this is our Grafana. And so this is what we use to um, cut, sort of keep track of stuff over time. So I can like set this to the past seven days and see like how many players are online at certain times. And so we can see that we hit like 50 peak players at certain times, uh, but we can also see that like right now we have a ton of players online. Um, 100 players right now, 102. Now, um, I'm gonna just bring up the learn here, which I think I have. Uh, oh wait, oh, I'm science technology. I think I I think this is fine to be in science technology. Oh, I have a, the titles messed up. One sec, I'll just change it to Valoran 0.10 release party. Um, watch our servers burn down in real time. There we go. That's uh, that's the the way that it is. Um, wait, what was I gonna do? Oh yeah, I was I was gonna pop up on Valoran here. Okay, I think I don't know if I have audio working on it, but you know, it is what it is. Just log in. I just want to make sure that every oops, busy, that everything's running all right. I'm a bit skeptical because it's, we've been at 102 players for a little bit. Oh, uh, X Mac, do we have any player limit on the server right now? I hope not. I hope not too. We can just you hit, two, we're we're gonna see. We just hit 104. Okay, okay, okay. One sec. Let me just uh, see if I can log in here. Um. I see it at 104, and uh, it's also like playing more smoothly than it was. Uh, oh, perfect. Party. Oh, this is great. Okay, very cool. So far, fingers crossed. And I have music playing, which is not capturing. Is it capturing? Okay. Can someone just uh, tell me if they can hear the music on Twitch? Uh, you can't know music on Twitch? I right. cannot. Okay, so desktop audio. I think I need to audio capture specifically audio capture pulse audio, maybe. I guess this is what I'm hearing in this headphone. Oh man, I can't tell. Is it? I might be just ruining it. Okay, now no. we have like a weird beep. Yeah, okay, I'll disable that. <laughs> Uh, Twitch link. Uh, yes, I can toss it in chat. Okay, cool. Um, so music playing for me. It's not playing for anybody else, but whatever. Uh, we'll we'll just keep talking because that's mostly what matters for the uh, for the stage right now. Um, uh, okay, so for anybody who's just joined now, that uh, everything seems to be going a little bit better. Uh, uh, the download link for this game is free. It's open source. You can take a look at it. Um, if someone wants to post that in VC related. Uh, so anybody else can get on if they like. Uh, we currently have over 100 players on the server right now. So in-game, we're recording 107. And then I think probably with Grafana will be the same. Uh, yeah, so, oh my goodness, we're already at one wait. Very cool. Now, um, as we were just talking about with XMAC, uh, so I'm, I'm streaming this on Twitch right now, so just take a look there if you're in our uh, stage on Discord. But with the... Um, the server ticks that happen. As we get more and more players, then it takes longer and longer for the server to um, each tick make sure that everything is taken care of. And so uh, the big issue that starts happening is that um, 
on one tick, it might take a little bit too long, and then that will start uh, ball, uh, like rolling down the hill for like future ticks. And so um, what we want to try and do is make sure that the server that we have can handle it uh, pretty well and make sure that each tick is as uh, fast as possible. And so right now, our ticks are looking to be about between 40 and 50 milliseconds, maybe a little bit higher. And what we're aiming for is to have each tick be 33 milliseconds. And that means that we can have 30 ticks per second. Um, and as we get more and more players, uh, so that that's one of the areas that are uh, that that will start to struggle. But then also another one is in network. And so right now we're transmitting to all of the clients, all 100 clients that are on right now, at about um, what's recorded to be about 15 megabytes per second. And that's pretty okay. That's like um, still less than that's a little bit more than 100 megabits per second. And in theory, our server should have up to about a gigabit, but it might fluctuate. So we, essentially, we don't want to be transmitting more than like let's say um, 50 megabits per second. That, that's a pretty safe zone. So I, I think we won't have too much problem with the networking for this release. Um, with RAM, uh, there's some. I'm just gonna mute Discord on my end or Valorant on my end. Uh, with RAM, there's some interesting stuff. Um, the the Valorant server takes significantly less RAM than it used to. It used to probably take like I don't know how much, but probably up to like 20 gigabytes or something like that to run this server. But now it's running at under five, which is amazing. Um, one of our developers added some changes that uh, significantly reduced the amount of um, uh, memory the, the server takes to run. So that's definitely a pretty I big think, improvement. I think the peak memory consumption in the 0.9 release party was something like 28 gigs, and that was when there was uh, 130 or so players. Interesting, interesting. So yeah, we're definitely... Uh, doing a lot better than we were back then. Um, I'm going to go back to our blog and see if I have, if I recorded um, how much we were taking back then. I don't know if I, which, which one that was. Uh, I think it was like 113 or something. Optimizations. Oh, this week's your point. Now. Okay, let's take a look at here. I might have screenshots that I added here. Uh, okay, release stats. Okay, perfect. So let's take a look at a few of these. Um, so players online, it looks like we got up to a peak, whatever this was. Uh, I think this was 133. Um, so that during our release party, that was about half an hour after it started. Um, that's what our peak was. And it looks like we're quickly approaching that. Right now, we're currently at uh, 117. Um, so first server ticks. Not, so not all the information is being shown here, but I'm uh, we, we can see that it's going like like high above 40 milliseconds, which really isn't great. And right now we're about 40 to 50 milliseconds. Um, so this is something that over future versions, this will be one of the biggest metrics that we want to improve. If we can keep tick time down to under 33 sec uh, milliseconds, um, uh, then that means that we can have more and more players join the server without uh, without there being issues server memory oh yeah check this out so we had a point where okay um our server memory this this was about an hour after the release party started for 0 0.9 our server memory went from uh five gigabytes it spiked up over five minutes uh, about 10 uh, over, over about 10 minutes to almost 28 gigabytes and then right here at 303 so an hour after our, our release started uh server crashed i assume uh I don't remember what happened. Yet. I remember that it, there, there was a there was a point at which a lot of things went very wrong. So I assume it was there. Um, slow systems. This sort of just tracks what's going wrong each tick. For the most part, um, it's ter from the looks of his terrain and uh, physics is another really big one that uh, we get bottlenecked with. Uh, these are CPUs, but we won't worry about this too too much just yet. And then network. Okay, so network before we were going up to like twenty five to thirty megabytes per second, which is really good. Um, in comparison to, uh, I mean, in the past, I know we used to do like 100 megabytes per second for all like all of the clients. And that's when we were running on DigitalOcean. Now, okay, so we're at 115, cool, cool, cool. Um, server tick time is still 50 milliseconds, so it still looks pretty okay. Uh, but RAM is significantly less, like we're less than five gigabytes, which I suppose like as we, there might be a spike if, if something goes wrong, but for now that's fine. Um, oh, and then CPU. So th this is the other thing, is that on the, the server that we're running on, we have um, 32 CPUs. It's a dedicated server from Hetzner. Uh, it's their new AMD uh, uh, dedicated server. And so I'm pretty sure it's running like, uh, I, I think the family's called like Milan or something like that. So it's, it's a pretty good CPU. But what we can see is that our 
um, CPUs are capping it out at about 30%. And the problem with this is that that means that the, the tasks that we have aren't properly being distributed across all of these CPU cores. And of course, this is this is one of like the, the biggest problems with game servers in general is that most game servers are completely single threaded because in a lot of other programming languages, it's very difficult to um, send out tasks to other uh, cores and get them to run it uh, in an efficient way. And so uh, to a certain extent, we're running into this, but we're still having, um, we, we still do a pretty good job at parallelizing. Um, and I think we actually have, uh, a chart somewhere. Okay, so the, yeah, this this chart is showing us how well we're doing at um, distributing the tasks. But effectively, what's happening is that we have one thread that still has to run the entire tick, um, or at least step through it all the way. And so uh, this thread can o can only be single uh, single core. And so if that process uh, is taking too long and it's not passing the stuff out properly. Um, then the only way to speed that up is to have a faster processor. So either like higher clock speed or higher, um, like the amount of stuff that you can do per clock cycle. Um, uh, and so I, I think that this release party is being helped out a lot by the fact that we're on this new uh, AMD uh, server chip. Um, we ran some benchmarks yesterday and they looked pretty good in comparison to previous Intel ones that we had been using with Hetzner. Um, now I, I've just spoken a lot, but if anybody else on the team wants to kind of step into anything I've said, uh, there's definitely a lot uh, there to unpack, or maybe like if I if I misspoke anywhere with a uh, parallelism or anything. Either X Mac or Wine Stock, if you if either of you have anything, or uh, otherwise I'll keep talking. I could talk for a while. Just keep talking for a bit. <laughs> <laughs> all right, sounds good. Um, all right, so uh, now that being said, um, our server is hosted in Germany. It's hosted at a data center called Hetzner. Uh, I forget which city in, in Germany, but um, I'm in North America. And so uh, what we can see is that my ping in the top left is like about 250 milliseconds, but it's not doing too bad. So like right now in, in the village, there's a lot of people who uh, have just spawned in and this is like the starting village. Uh, we have like an airship over there. We got a tree that looks like it's been badly burned. Um. And so there's like, let's say like 20 or 30 people around spawn. Um, now, when this server tends to have high, like the, the tick rates are like, let's say uh, up to like 100 milliseconds or something like that, then what we'll tend to see is that like you really can't see like the players moving around at all or there'll be like a lot of rubber banding or anything like that. But for now, we're doing we're doing pretty all right. Um, okay, I have my UI off. Let me go back here. So uh, this is the map uh, that is loaded in. Um, during each release, we normally ship a new map uh and so um it, so if you take a look at the aesthetics if you're not familiar with Valoran, it looks a lot like minecraft um you got like the the voxel type of look um and then uh it also looks a lot like cube world which is what we originally um started this project to to be based on sort of and to be inspired by um but there's a lot of things that uh we we do quite a bit differently and so one of the big ones is that our terrain generation and our um sort of like the, like the mountains that we can see off in the distance here are using some really interesting techniques to be rendered. And so where in Minecraft, you would normally not be able to like see stuff far away because like the chunk, chunks haven't been uh, generated or anything like that. Um, in Valorant, you can see everything that's far away, but we're not actually rendering all of those millions and millions of voxels over by that mountain. And instead we're rendering a very um, low quality version, but it still uh, looks um, like proper and everything like that. And so with, uh, with these mountains, and the way that they're they're shown off, um, they are like super like low quality. But if you go over to these mountains, uh, they they do actually look like that. And so um, as we get closer and closer, it'll actually load in the terrain. But here, if I if I zoom out, we can see um, that these mountains they have like a, a fake like sort of hill effect that we have going on here. And so when I'm zoomed in, like we we like those still do look like they they are made out of like cubes. Um, but as we approach them, they're actually they're actually fake. And so, like, if we go but beyond the zone that is being generated, uh, like with chunks, we can see that uh, it drops off. But that allows us to see um, mountains around the entire map um, at once, and because this is pretty easy to render in and just have um, like visible just like that. But anyways, that's uh, that's sort of a deep dive. If uh, anybody's just interested in playing the game, that's just some of the technical stuff. Um, but what I was trying to get at is the erosion systems that we do for uh, these mountains. Um, are super complex and they take a long time to generate. And so I think to generate a new map from scratch would probably take like uh, uh, several hours, I feel. Um, and so we just instead bundle a new map version with every, oh no, I might get attacked here. 
uh, we bundle a new map version with every uh, release. And so you can get some like new content, some new generation. Um, but one of the really big inspirations for um, for Valorian is a game called Dwarf Fortress, where when you uh, spawn the world, it will generate a whole bunch of um, stuff that goes on. It'll make like pretty realistic looking terrain, although it is a 2D game. Um, everybody's getting on this airship. I'm gonna, I'm gonna try to go with them. Let's see if I can get on board. Um, okay, I think people are hitting each other off. This might not be very easy. I want to turn on server authoritative physics. Is this am I on client right now? Uh, I'm not sure. By default, you're on client. Okay, here. Um, since since I'm NA, I might have issues with that. Uh, which setting is it under? Uh, gameplay. Gameplay and client authoritative. Okay, so we'll give this a try and see how see how it works. But I guess like when I'm in the airship. Okay, so uh, essentially what we can see is like as I walk around, um, I mean, I can feel it more than anything, uh, but it's like a little bit less responsive just because it does check with the server first to be, make sure that I am actually able to move. Um, now, since my, my ping is high, that's mostly what it's coming from, from. But what's sort of surprising is that it's like this responsive with this many players online, which we currently have 112. Um, oh yeah, so uh, back to like the, the Dwarf Fortress kind of thing. Or... Wine stock, you have something? Uh, could I uh, talk a bit more about the uh, client versus server authoritative? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, go for it. Yeah, because we're all taken off in the airship now. Um, yeah, so with the um, so the way that server authoritative uh, physics works is that um, all of your inputs are sent to the server, and the server tells you like what position you're at after it calculates physics. Um, with client authoritative, um, there's a, which is sort of like a hack to make the perceived latency lower. Um, the client also runs a copy of the physics and uh, then tells the server, in addition to the inputs, um, okay, set my position, velocity, and orientation directly to these values and don't tell me my own position. Um, so, and like that can lead to, uh, Several other issues, like um, in uh, like in the presence of desyncs, um, you the the positions that you're telling the server, uh, like there will be gaps between them, so like movement won't be as smooth from the server's perspective, uh, and that uh, exacerbates some problems with uh, physics, uh, such as or leading to things like falling through airships. Yeah, I'm just uh, posting the link to our uh, stream right here. All right, so that is for the Discord. Cool, cool. All right. Um, yeah, so as, as we can see, like as I'm moving around, there's like a little bit of uh, jankiness to it, but. Um, a lot of this can be resolved, first of all, if you're playing with a server that's close to you, or if you're playing with a server that has fewer than 100 players on it. Now, in the future, we are definitely going to work on optimizing this because um, if, if the engine that we have can support this many players, then I, I feel that a lot of people will be creating... Oh, goodbye, someone. Uh, will be creating content that um, uh, can, is designed around having 40 players on the screen at once. Um, and I think during the last release party is when the airships first came out and... Uh, it was uh, very risky when you're standing on one if you'd be able to uh, to stay on because uh, yeah you'd just be able to to fall through sometimes depending on how physics was handled. Now okay, so the the thing is I'm a level one character and I might actually just die here because the people in here are much stronger than I. Oh, and I fell through. Okay, that's fine. I will uh, fly to the ground. And uh, is anybody on the airship right now? Can I TP to someone? I am. Uh, slipped. Easy peasy. All right, cool, cool, cool. Uh, those are admin powers, so not everybody has them. Um, it would be helpful to make myself uh, invulnerable so I don't die. However, um, I don't trust that uh, I'll accidentally mess something up with the with the admin stuff. So I'll leave it as has now, and I'll just teleport back to slip if I need. You can you can use a slash kit debug. Uh, or kit space debug to give yourself the admin stuff that's invincible. <laughs> uh, a second too late. I am. Uh, I'll be a part of Big Chungus's group. 
All right, let me uh, toss on the invulnerability stuff just so I don't die again. Uh, I think this is all I need for now. Okay, cool, cool, cool. Uh, yeah, I don't think I could die. Okay, so we'll teleport. Oops, easy. Teleport back to slipped. All right, cool, cool, cool. So we're back on the airship now. Um, all right, so we got a, a little bit of a party going here. So uh, as we can see on the, the left-hand side, oops, easy. Um, there's a few people who've joined the party. And now you can like see their uh, like little green uh, bars here. So I know that I'm on like the, the same team as them. Uh, Slip, do you want to chat a little bit about um, some of the uh, recent animation combat meets kind of stuff? If you were there. Uh, yeah, yeah, I can do that. Um, this is probably one of the first versions I would say where I didn't feel like I sort of had to keep animating stuff to keep up with like the pace of the game. Um, because prior to this, I think I was just like always um, like there, there were always animations I guess that kind of needed to be reworked and improved um, but now for the first time I sort of like had a little bit of flexibility um, so I worked on like some boss animations but also got to spend a lot of time um, recently on like the meet MR which was um, sort of set up a lot of the basic progression like the armor progression system in Valoran which um, Basically, what it did, I guess, was it it added like a lot new a lot of new crafting options and kind of set up a lot of the game design that we've been planning for a while. Um, and so now there are things like um, different kinds of armors that are like cloth or leather or mail, um, and they represent like different types of um, like in-game strategies. Like you can wear mail armor to be like a little bit more tanky. You can wear cloth armor to be play a little bit more offense, which gives you like a lot of energy and lets you do like a lot of more special moves. Um, and then there's hide armor, which gives you a lot of critical hits. And so it's good for like pure DPS and will also eventually give you like um, stealth bonuses and stuff like that. Um, and so that was a pretty cool MR to work on. It would also involve things like um, reworking caves a good amount so that we could um, like it's it's all based on crafting, and so there was like a cave rework that went into it, which allows you to like go into caves and mine different ores um, to get deeper into the game. Um, and so that's been going pretty good. That released, I think it was on Monday. Um, I needed a few follow ups to sort of refine things, and we'll need some some future balance work to to make everything work a little bit smoother. Um, but there's now like a I would say a, a pretty good. Um, like beginning to end game path that you can take in the game that helps with like um, and that, that gives some distinction to like different play styles and like, I'm excited to I think see people starting to experiment with like wearing different types of armors with different types of weapons and stuff like that and and really like kind of um, starting to to take advantage of like a lot of the original things that we wanted to do with game design that we're going to make Valoran unique. Yeah, uh, it looks like we're all uh, at the dungeon here. I think most people are already on the uh, in, in the group, and so uh, someone's asking for an invite here. How do I invite someone? Is it just? Oh, I guess I oh. Then... I think there's an invite command. Oh yeah, you can probably right click to invite or click to click. Wait, is Sarah in? Okay, I think most people in the in the dungeon are uh, are grouped up here. I won't attack anything because I have like all of the. Uh, cheaty kind of stuff but i will i'll participate by watching and talking i will be the bard of this quest um so everybody's fighting this uh cultist warlord over here uh that seems to be getting the better of all the level ones but <laughs> that's fine um this is the hardest dungeon <laughs> oh yeah is it a there's yeah <laughs> So maybe some people came prepared, but um, others I think not. Uh, I was gonna try to put on. Do we have an easy? Okay, I, I guess I could just go into the folder. I just want to put like some of the the Valoran back, background music on while we're uh, doing stuff because I don't have any of the audio coming through, uh, which I could try and fix, but I don't trust that I won't just mess it up. Let me see here. So. Going to get. Yeah, I mean, mentioned the mining skill tree. There's some cool stuff that's lined up, even like right after 0 0.10 releases are probably like starting on Monday, Tuesday. Um, like, I've already worked recently on a mining skill tree, which is going to tie into progression, tie into the new progression stuff in a really cool way that allows you to like gather ore and get experience for it, and then use that experience to put into like mining skills, like um, 
like multipliers on the amount of ores you find and mining speed increases and stuff like that. And so we're starting to get into a lot of like um, stuff that's not direct. Like early on, I would say it's been a lot of combat that's been the focus, but we're starting to get into things that aren't really exactly tied to it. Things like um, other types of progression and exploration, which I think is is really neat. Oh, okay, okay, I found the overworld playlist. Let's see if I can play this with DLC. Working with. Hmm. Do I even have DLC on here? No, I do. Can I just copy the folder I'm in? I think so. Is that playing? Can someone on Twitch verify if that's like playing music? Unfortunately, it won't come through on Discord, but uh, if you're on the uh, in the Twitch, is there anybody on? Uh... I can hear a little bit. I think subtle. Alright. I don't know if it's like too loud in comparison to uh talking. I'll turn it down a little bit. You can probably go a little higher, I think. A little higher, eh? Wait, slip, can you say something again? I just want to make sure that my audio with you is good. Uh yep, this is me. Alright, let me turn you up a little bit on my side as well. Alright. All right, I'm gonna assume that that's good. It looks like, yeah, it looks like my Discord might be, I don't know how to separate this stuff on uh, on OBS, but whatever. Okay, let's go find where everybody else is. I think they went downstairs here. I do not know where the downstairs is. Wait, uh, Slipped, are you downstairs? <laughs> All right, problem solved. Cool, cool, cool. All right, so a lot of cultist warlords over here. Again, I'm just observing. I made it to the boss. Is that uh, on the bottom? Right, we're down there. All right, cool. Hey, perfect. Okay, cool. Uh, <laughs> it's crazy seeing the group view with everybody on here. It's like we have a World of Warcraft uh, UI up and running here. All right, so uh, a lot of cultist warlords chasing people around. I'm currently just a, a meat shield, since I do not have the attribute that one would call health. Ah, I can level up by just running around. That's pretty cool. All right, so they're fighting the mind flayer. I'm just uh, here to observe, but there's a, a few people giving it a go. Thirty minutes over 100 players, no server downtime. That is that's pretty good. Once we hit the one hour mark, that's when we see if uh, if stuff is actually going wrong. Let me just uh, do, do, do game server. Let's check that out. Um, actually, wait, no, the boss fight is happening. That's more interesting. Let's see what happens with the boss fight. Okay, people are starting to do some damage. The mind flare is healing quite a lot, I think. Or maybe that's just because I have client authoritative. Oh, never mind. It's, uh, it's going to be an F in chat for the, for the mind flare here. He's interesting. He spawns like minions and then he uses like the. Is like that life drain thing, which actually like takes health away from his own summons. Interesting. Oh, there's an air mind flare. This one spawned that, or there's oh, yeah. <laughs> there's, an... <laughs> no, <it's> <laughs> <hour>. <laughs> there's three of them. All right. Well, this is a uh, this will make for a good fight here. They're just multiplying. This is uh, very interesting. I definitely don't think that there's enough. Uh players here there, there might be they're, they're working pretty hard on them so with the uh with the current classes that we have uh um do we have like four or five different ones? Oh my smog have, i think it's six weapons um and like the the, the kind of gimmick of the system is that you can always swap your weapon and so like you can just press you can always have a secondary weapon and tab to that um 
and you can like pick up anything at any time and it starts going into it and so there's there's a lot of options there and like freedom i see i think i just insta killed something by accident i don't know if my uh oh, yeah okay okay i should i should not be shooting stuff there's a i definitely have like an insta kill thing on all right that's a lot of chaos but i mean it's, it's running super smooth I'm just going to wipe out everything there. All right, so going back to the server stuff here. Sounds very quiet, if anything. Okay, audio is quiet. That, that's super weird. I wonder if ever, like if all the speakers are quiet as well. I'm going to turn it up on OBS. What do you guys do for a living? It's cool that you're able to make this free. Yeah, so I think that's a, a pretty good question. Um, a lot of the developers on the project uh, definitely do this as like a pastime type of thing. I'm just gonna turn down my audio because I feel like I definitely pushed it too far. Um, yeah, so uh, this this started out just as like a passion project, as like a side project kind of thing. Um, so we can take a look at the, the code base here. I'm sorry for white mode, I'm in Chromium and I don't have... Well, actually, I can fix this problem. Dark Reader. Mm, very good. Problem solved. All right, very cool. So uh, we actually had our third birthday a few weeks ago uh, at the end of May. And so when the project started, uh, several people kind of just got together and they're like, hey, it would be really cool if we could make an open source version of Cube World because we really like that game. We like a lot of the dynamics. We like the um, sort of the feel of the game, um, everything like that. And so uh, they got together and started working on like a voxel engine to be able to do stuff. And then at the beginning of 2019, um, we all started. Re so that's when I hopped onto the project and that's when we took the uh, the engine and then made a completely new engine where we had like we learned a lot of things about it. Um, a lot of areas that uh, it went wrong and then uh, fixed all of those. And so um, now we're about two years old and everybody who's joined the project has found it because um, either they're interested in um, the, this topic or like this this theme of a game. And so wanting to create something with these types of aesthetics and everything. Um, or uh, a lot of people have also come because so the programming language that we're using uh, Rust is quite a new one uh, that, that's sort of emerging in the field and um, it's maturing a lot and we've uh, been able to show that it really does a lot of super cool stuff for uh, game development so actually if I go to rwegameyet.com uh, we can see like the, the progress on uh, Rust being used as a um like as a programming language for game development and it shows you like all of the libraries that you can use for everything like that and then all of the games that are there and if you go to games and you scroll down wait i don't know are we on action or we're on open world oh uh, yeah Valorant right there very cool we should really update this photo though because i i put it up there like a year and a half ago probably um but yeah so i there's a lot of things that Rust gives us that really make it easy to do a lot of development at the scale and at the speed. So what I mean by that is like, we have about 20 contributors that are like actively doing things every single week. Um, and that is really helped by the fact that with the Rust language, we don't have to worry about as many things as we would if we were using C++ or other um, languages that have historically been used for game development. And then similarly, as this, this question tends to come up, like, why would we um, like use Rust over like a game engine, um, like either Unity or Unreal? And, and the reason for that is that we can really narrow down to a lot of the optimizations that are super specific to um, Valorant. And so this is like when you have a uh, voxel world, when you want to have this many players doing multiplayer, um, you don't want a general purpose engine that's really good at solving um, every problem. You want a, an engine that's built specifically for this problem. And so um, if you're familiar with how Minecraft works at all, um, there's like these idea of chunks in the world uh, and um, each chunk can be generated procedurally. So like the rules that make it look like mountains or terrain or anything like that. Um, and so we wanted to make sure that when we were doing our own chunks, we could have our own guarantees. And so, for example, one of the well, not really guarantees, but one of the benefits that we have with our chunks is that they can sort of be arbitrarily high. And so whereas in Minecraft, you can only build up to like a 256 height limit because that's the size of um, whatever data structure or what data type is being stored in uh, with Valoran, you can go much, much higher. And I'm, I'm sure with Minecraft, they're, they're changing that and updating that. Um, but we, we took that as like at the beginning, we know we want really tall mountains for you to be able to explore. 
Like if I go back into the game here, I can't okay, be not allowed to scroll out. People are still fighting everything in here. This is uh, very chaotic right now. Um, here, I'll just uh, home myself. And okay, so if, if I zoom out, we can see the mountains that are here are like super tall. Uh, and uh, like they can go super low as well. <laughs> and so, um, yeah, because because we we started out by saying for our engine we need this, then we were able to build the the chunks, um, which we actually call chunks because we do them in a sort of an interesting way. Um, but we we were able to to know right away that we we have this uh, this power to go as high as we need. Um, and so, I forget why I was talking about like uh, our our past or anything like that, but um, I don't know what I was talking about. All right, well, I'll, I'll just keep talking. Uh, so with, with development, um, it's been about three years now. Uh, we've become one of like the, the flagships of what game development in Rust can look like because um, none of our code is written in C++ except for like, like I guess we do link to some libraries that might be for like graphics or sound or anything. And, and some portions of those might be written in C++, but none of the stuff that we do is written in C++. And then I suppose like if you look at GLSL, which is like the shader language as C++ or like C++ Lite or like similar, then we have some stuff there. Um, but there's also a lot of work being done to uh, get the ecosystem to work entirely within Rust. And so I think uh, I haven't checked out our, uh, our chat in a little bit, but if any of the people are here and any admins are able to correct me, I, we recently moved over to WGPU, which is like a rendering backend, which is written completely in Rust. Um, and so that allows us to have like bulk and support instead of what we originally started with, with uh, OpenGL. Um, oh, actually, there's a question in chat. What do you guys do for a living? Okay, so that's why I started talking about this. So a lot of uh, it's really interesting. The background of people that work on Valoran, there's a ton of people who uh, are, well, first of all, spread out all around the world. We have um, a lot of people from North America, a lot of people from Europe, um, so, like several from like Australia and Asia. Um, and because we try to keep our barriers low uh, to like contributions and people getting in, um, it has made it so that anybody from around the world is able to come and contribute regardless of skill to a certain extent. Like if you want to participate in uh, this project, um, there's definitely something that can be done that you are capable of doing. And so, uh, for example, like we have like the, the people who are doing code and who know Rust a lot and everything like that. Um, but then you know, just a TP back to slipped. Um, all right, with everything going on here, cool. So uh, we have all of the coders, the people who are like really into game development and know a lot of stuff. And they're always wanting to help new coders uh, like learn and get used to working on the project and everything. But then we also have a ton of artists and composers and writers and um, people to just work on like UI or um, to just like add more documentation to our book on how to run certain things. And a lot of these uh, we keep, or we, we have a lot of low barriers to entry on these. And so, um, and, and one of the biggest things is that we have a ton of people from all around the world helping us translate Valoran into a lot of different languages. And so our process for that is we have a file for each language that you can go into. You can read like what the English version should say, and then you can um, say uh, or, or just add what it should be in, in your language. And so that's like a really great way for people to um, contribute. But that being said, uh, so coming back to our contributors, um, we have people who are in high school, who are in university, who work in the diff like tons of different industries um, in a lot of different countries. And, um, and and sometimes you'll have people come in who have just so much experience, either like in Rust or in uh, mathematical theory or anything, um, who are able to do some super cool things. And so, for example, um, Sharp, one of our core developers, I uh, did our erosion system and overhauled lighting and the, did a level of detail. And he was he, he's doing his PhD. Um, he's working on uh, like providing guarantees to show that Rust is like a safe, like a, a provably safe language. Um, but he also just sat down and read a ton of papers about how erosion works so that he can implement it in the game. And then uh, similarly, we have like. Uh, Christoph, who recently joined the project, but he's been overhauling a lot of the um, economy system and uh, a lot of the with the world simulation with how NPCs trade. And then uh, Zester has done a ton of work on like procedurally generating dungeons and procedurally generating towns. And Slipped has uh, come up with like a animation system that we can completely write an engine. And so like everybody really brings a lot of super unique things to the table that you wouldn't really be able to see at a company in some ways because you don't 
have like the the luxury of just um letting people come in and do what they want or like spend as much time on these these uh these tasks that they, they want to do and so um what do so overall what do people do for a living uh, a lot of people will have like their their professional day jobs and then um come out and work on this on the weekend or i uh, come in and uh, participate like a, for like a, an hour a night or something like that um but because we have uh the, the discord we're able to communicate and chat with one another and see what we're working on and talk about uh, problems that we're encountering um and because there's people all around the world then it's, it's really like there's not a lot of time that the server doesn't have stuff going on i think like when europe is asleep that's like when it's like the quietest but then that's also when na is like getting like late at night and so always stuff going on um question are there plans for a mobile edition so with rust it's pretty easy to target a lot of different platforms because all we need is for um, Rust to be able to build a target for whatever architecture. So whether it be mobile or um, Windows, Mac, Linux, that kind of stuff. As long as there's a target that's built for it, then it's normally not too difficult. Now, that being said, there's a, a lot of uh, um, sort of like extra conditions, like when it comes to uh, how certain libraries that we use, certain crates are built. Like maybe some of the graphics things I uh, can't export as easily to, to certain things just yet. Um, but we do have documentation on how to run the server on a Raspberry Pi. And so, um, and since most of the developers are Linux users, we do have a heavy focus on making it super portable across many different platforms. Um, so a mobile version would be very cool. Um, optimization might be difficult in certain capacities, but I, um, I, I think definitely we've, we've all thought about like, it'd be super cool to see the game on Steam and to see it be usable on like different devices and different uh, uh, systems and everything like that. Um, <laughs> so I, apparently someone is working on to learn uh, on Android. And so the, the front end, so with the game right now, if you boot up Airshipper and you install the game, this front end is like the visual front end, but then we can also have like other front ends that like list it, that, that make the same network requests and everything, uh, but just display it differently. So one of them is like a command line. Um, viewer where essentially you can connect to the server and then play the game and it looks a lot like dwarf fortress it looks a lot like just like a 2d type of uh um like visualization of uh, of the world um all right yeah so uh, uh abby just posted in chat the uh the link to it it's, it's pretty nifty for sure all right i just want to check with all my other uh devs here how uh how it's going if uh, if anybody wants to chip in and add something, or if I just keep talking about stuff, I can do either. Um, so I think with the uh, Android port, the um, the difficulty in getting like Boxygen itself to run isn't so much like getting it to compile, but just that a lot of uh, or Boxygen makes a lot of assumptions about like what the minimum like graphics hardware that's supported is. Uh, so Taloran is able to run on Android because it pretty much just requires text rendering, mm -hmm. uh, but Voxygen itself is like less likely to be uh, runnable on uh, mobile. Yeah. Um, yeah, because there's definitely like a lot that you have to make sure it works. And so we've definitely put on a lot of work to make sure that it runs pr like pretty solid on Windows, Mac, Mac and Linux, just because like those are like the, the places that you'll have PC gaming. Um, is my okay? My stream call is okay. Uh, I'm going to uh, I'm gonna cheat a bit here. I'm gonna go up to the top of a mountain and I'll do a glide so anybody can uh, see how that looks. All right, I'm out of there. We'll go up to the peak over there. The server does not feel uh, happy about what I'm doing right now. So yeah, as we can see, as I approach this mountain over here, um, currently it's like the low level of detail, but as we get closer, we'll see that this is actually, okay, so I'll stop right here-ish, uh, maybe a bit closer. But the, like the, the mountain will be built under it as as it's shown. Um, and so I can pretty well trust that I'm not gonna fly through there and hit, uh, hit something that um, isn't there. And so that's like one of like the really great pieces of the, uh, um, like this level of detail type of thing is that, uh, it can be super easily generalized. Okay, yeah, black hole. There we go. So yeah, we can see it like fading away into like what the mountain actually is. Um, okay, so I'm on top mountain here. 
I'm just gonna chill for a sec because the server is gonna try to catch up. Uh, and let me just put away my. Okay, now I got the bow. All right. A little bit of snow up here. We can see the valley over there. I'm trying to find a good side to jump off of. But we'll take a look at the server and how it's doing first. Alright. So, we're sitting at 100-ish players right now. Um, server ticks are still doing quite well. So, I'm, I'm super happy uh, that we used the AMD chips for, uh, for this release because... Um, even though we haven't had too, too many optimizations this release on how each tick works, um, it's still doing pretty all right. So what we can see in the server tick is that if we break it down, um, it's taking about 50 milliseconds. And the grant, like the most of that is um, the, the state. And so uh, we can see uh, the state is 50 milliseconds and everything else is quite a, quite a bit uh, lower than that. And then similarly, if I go, we, we could take a look at what, like, what systems are actually slow within the state. And so we can see that terrain is taking a lot of time. Um, physics, physics is doing a lot better than it normally does. Normally physics is like at least double everything else. Um, so what, when we look at this type of thing, what we want to be able to see is ways to, so for example, like with, with physics, um, I think a lot of it has to be done, uh, one thing after another to make sure that nothing collides. But on the other hand, let's say like I'm going in one direction of like in the map and it's like rendering terrain over there and then someone else is going in a different direction then what um what should be doing like done every tick is that it will say okay we need to build these three chunks for this player um and then these three chunks for this other player and then it should take those six chunks and then spread them out to different cores so that they can be processed simultaneously um and so if we're seeing that um terrain is like spiking then more often than not uh oh actually so I don't actually know this for certain. There's a lot of people who are super smart on the product that know a lot better. But what I would assume is that um, it's having difficulty at these points properly splitting these up to the different cores. Anybody can correct me if I'm uh, if I'm wrong on that. Uh, so I guess could you scroll down a little bit in the Grafana to the um, total CPU burned by system per tick graph? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think it's this one right here. So that's showing that uh, terrain and physics and agent still are like the three most expensive things. But surprisingly, that terrain is more expensive than physics at the moment. Yeah, because normally physics would be significantly higher than everything else, right? Like, like terrain has never come this close, I feel. So this would probably... so. Now, now that, that being said, so what this, what these numbers here, what the units here mean is that every single tick, um, uh, for example, terrain is taking in this case, 422 milliseconds worth of time, uh, compute time. And now the way that that works, because every, every tick is only 33 milliseconds, but since we can distribute work across a lot of different cores, then that's why it's able to go significantly higher is because we have 32 different cores running and it's able to take that, like that much compute time. So that, that's like the aggregated amount every, every tick. Um, so yes. Nor like normally, so if we go and optimize the game, uh, clearly the, the points that we want to optimize are physics and terrain and then agent. And so you don't want to opt like optimize areas that uh, don't need it before. So if it, for example, it would not make sense to go optimize like metrics or something because that, that's completely negligible or even like interpolation, invite time or whatever. Um, those systems are negligible in comparison to like the, the hundreds of milliseconds that each are taking. Now, that being said, um, if the number is super high, then it probably means that it's being parallelized okay, um, but it's still the area that we want to, uh, to combat the most. Um, just some additions. In the in this example, this is the message for terrain. This means this is the time we take to send out terrain messages, and this is so high because we are compressing those messages, and the compression algorithm just takes a lot of time. Yeah. So, for example, with, Actually, with terrain compression is terrain compression is uh, included by in default. It's like with the plate and not with the PNG stuff. It's it's still slow. It's still ah. like a lot of time. If, if it's still scaling quite badly, it's um, two hundred. I'm wondering if uh, now is a good time to ask uh, people to experiment with enabling uh, lossy terrain God. compression in the graphics God, settings. Not not so doing the party. <laughs> Uh, Maybe this is, so that is it in settings? 
Is there a line for the setting? Graphics settings. And then... And, um, while you're experimenting, I would uh, say something else. There are two points of optimizing a server. So, one optimization, this is what you, Angel, just spoke about, is, is optimizing for a huge number of players. And this is exactly what we have to do then. Optimize the system which scale very badly or are very expensive. But we could also optimize in the sense of making like a single player experience very optimized or like with four to five players in that case for example other systems need to be optimized for example the um, world simulation which is taking quite it's a constant factor for example for world simulation it's independent of the number of players active on the server but of course um, if you just want to play with a few friends this constant number can make up quite a bit and if you maybe only have a raspberry pi to host it on or a small laptop it would help to optimize that too. But, uh, never mind. I think I turned it on. Uh, does it just make it easier for me to load the uh, the train, or um, it compresses chunks with um, it? It trades off more CPU to get the network messages smaller. Um, so I guess I don't know. So if we're having an issue with, uh, we're using not enough CPU relative to network utilization, this will help. If the issue is we're using too much CPU, this might hurt. Uh, so I guess that's kind of what I wanted to experiment with. Yeah. It's trading CPU time for network compression for you. Maybe if you are on mobile or on slow internet. It's at a significant increase of, or double increase of CPU time. Probably at least at the server, but maybe also at the client, right? Client size shouldn't matter too much, I think. Like, I, I feel like that's within the the realm of not yeah, too yeah, bad for the client. Because it does not scale that bad. Like, a server needs to compress for 150 people, the client only <laughs> yeah. needs to compress for one. Exactly, exactly. But, but if I that mean, can be uh, just... split up, then that shouldn't... Well, the, and the oh, compressed nice. messages are shared. So, like, if... It only has to compress the chunk once for um, in order to be able to send the compressed chunk to everyone nearby. Only if in the same tick multiple multiple people require uh, request the same chunk, right? Um, if in multiple ticks, so it, people, it might, not, people, it might not cache them between chunks. Here because right. it, it does not cache them for for like a number of. I'm definitely not playing with the uh, recommended experience in mind right now, uh, but kind of showing off the gladding a little bit. So I've been running some uh, some tests locally because I have like a server here at home with like 48 cores across two CPUs, and uh, what I want to try and uh, come up with is a way um, to test. Uh, if we so if I'm running a server and it has 24 cores, which is, they're not the best, but like it also give me good metrics. Then I want another server to be able to just spawn like 100 bots, um, all of which should just like uh, spawn into the game and start like walking away from spawn in like a random direction, and just, like with the, just, just the objective of getting as, as far away as possible. And then um, the the idea is that if I, like, I I suppose I, I could track how fast like the network is like what the what the network bandwidth is, as well as um, uh, see like how lossy terrain compression does in comparison to um, not lossy, and so uh, this should give like a, a some pretty good telemetry on how the parallelization is going, um, and yeah, kind of just uh, make it easier to diagnose where where some potential issues are in the future. I love the sky right now. Like one one of the things that amazes me is just how much work that like people on the team have put into uh, making like the sky and the, the terrain just look so good. Because um, this is like something I've definitely never seen in like any other uh, any other game. Um, recently, uh, Zestra was the one to do all of this volumetric uh, cloud stuff. I think maybe with some help of uh, some other people. Um, but then I I think uh, Sharp was the one to do like like the lighting we see here on like trees and stuff like that. Um, and so, uh, and and some nights you can we have like a an aurora borealis that's uh, very cool to see. 
All right, let me uh, check my flashlight here. All right, I'll probably wait till day to do the uh, do this jump just so it's a little bit brighter out. Actually, wait, we'll, we'll just you want to skip to day? Uh, wait, I, I want to do that myself because I want to show I want to show what it like what it looks like. Oh yeah, look at that, like fast speed. Okay, I'm, I'm gonna do that one more time because I, I like looking at it. Okay, here, check this out. Check this out. Look at that. That's so cool. I wish we had a way. Like, I, I need to go into the code and just like, oh cool, airship shows up. Um, I need to go into the code and just like make something that automatically always makes time go that fast, just so I can get like a recording because I think that'd be a super cool, uh, um, almost time lapse to to just have from like a couple different vantage points. Uh, people are asking what's going on with the with the, yeah, because there's like a hundred people who is just teleported from night to day. All right. So, so did... that airship just uh, it, on the screen just like crashed into the mountain, but then managed to lift off and like navigate itself around the mountain. How? So what? What does it do for that? Like, do airships have some type of notion of how? Uh, um, like the direction they're going or anything that they might run into um yeah so right now so since the physics update earlier this month they run on buoyancy instead of anti-gravity uh that's uh, l doctrine's work um and um that, that broke the ai for a while because um previously it was the ai was tuned to controlling the anti-gravity to basically adjust the thing upwards uh, away from the to be a fixed height away from the ground as determined by a mix of um, the uh, checking distance of the airship's Z coordinate to the uh, to the LOD terrain altitude and also ray casting to like a wedge in front of the airship um, to, to see both like if there's like trees or mountains ahead like it should um, it should gain altitude to deal with that um, and also like Raycasting downwards, just like in case the in case there's a mit, mismatch between the voxel terrain and the LOD terrain. Mm -hmm. um, and so recently, I adapted that to use uh, a PID controller to uh, adjust the buoyancy. Uh, PID controllers are things for um, for basically getting um, like processes with uh, feedback to be able to like reach a stable state. Um, so now that's being used to adjust the buoyancy, so it um, like flies more smoothly with the new controls. Interesting, interesting. Yeah, I haven't had uh, had a go at, at piloting one yet, but um, I, I think like this type of uh, well, first of all, like the ray casting does make it look like a uh, if an NPC is driving it or if it's just going from town to town like on a trade route or something like that. Um, quite yeah, quite realistic, which is uh, very cool, I think. Slipped, are there any other uh, pretty big things from 0 0.10 that I should show off, do you think? Um, have you seen a cave? Oh, I haven't. True, true, true. Let's say... Uh... Do you want to go find one and I'll uh, TP to you? You have them um, on the mark. They're marked on the map, if you see the little wait, like, archway. I, am I literally over top one right now? Yes. Oh, it should, wait, it should right be here, around. Okay. If you zoom out a bit... I think it's that thing right down there. Yeah. Yeah. All right, so yeah, there's a... Uh, actually, can you tell us a little bit about the cave update? Uh, yeah, so I didn't actually really touch... Oh, I think this is a... I, th I think I know this cave. I think it's a good one. Um, I didn't actually touch the physical, like, layout of caves. That was all Zester's work um, from a while back. But we... But, but what they were due for was, like, a little bit of, like, an overhaul just as far as, like, the lighting in them because we've gotten glow lighting since we did caves and they really weren't taking too much advantage of it. Um... They needed color, which they have now. So there's like different types of dirt that's on the ground as opposed to before when it was always kind of gray. Um, there's like color on the ceiling as well. And there's also these like big white like scaffolding things that we added in. Um, and so a lot of like aesthetic also, um, we built a lot of the progression system into these. And so like, there's a um, there's a difficulty curve that'll like increase as you go. Like you're starting to run into tougher enemies now. Um, and they will have like tougher ores with them. And so like you can kinda you can continue like basically through endgame in a cave, but it will take like 
a few hours before you actually have good enough gear to like get to the end of the cave where all the best stuff is stored. Interesting, interesting. Yeah, so I think uh, I, I'm not too familiar with like the the resource uh, stuff here, but I can see that there's definitely like a lot of uh, crystals everywhere and different ores and stuff like that. So can you tell me a little bit about how, um, how like uh, how you might use them for crafting or anything? Yeah, um, right now you're on I think second level as far as resources go. Like the first level, as you walk in, you get access to I think it's copper and copper and tin which are used to craft bronze and then bronze is like the first male armor um and on that level there's only i think passive passive npcs and so nothing actually fights you then you get to like the the layer with like salamanders and what we call rock snappers which are, like those big gray turtle things which which cover i think it's cobalt and um iron and coal which help you craft like iron armor and steel armor and coal and cobalt armor towards like the end of that level now you're onto i think a you're getting near the last level, which adds, um, like right now you're starting to run into lava drakes, which are those big uh, orange dragony things, and then basilis, which are the purple ones. And so this is like pretty tough to fight through, and pretty soon you'll hit the um, the last layer, which is where we run into like bipeds, and so you'll have like cyclops and um, and uh, trolls and things like that, and then they'll basically guard. Um, the highest tier materials which are i think gold silver and uh bloodstone interesting and those are used to make some of the best armors in the game did in bc related the command for giving yourself a pickaxe uh if you wanted to like demonstrate the mining on screen yeah i could that yeah that's probably a good idea i'm just gonna get knocked around but uh that was you can uh right. slash uh, do slash buff space, um, is it invincible or is it in, oh, slash buff space invulnerable one space 1000. I think I'm already invulnerable, so I, I have like the admin gear on. You are, but, but if you do the invulnerable buff, buff you won't it. Their AR, or oh, oh, they're chilling. Dang, that's crazy. Pretty cool now. Now we can we can see the animals without actually having to experience them. Yeah. Okay. So I haven't used a pickaxe before. Oh, I killed that. How do I how do I target like the uh, the ore itself? The crystals aren't mineable. They're just they're mostly to provide oh, some okay, lighting. Okay. Um, you can find some ores which are look a little bit different. Okay, like this. <laughs> oh, e. So I can just uh. Harvest, harvestable sprites will have uh, their name appear. Um, they say E, but you have to, like, left-click with M1 to yeah. mine them. Okay. A lot of Drake's are chilling now. I'm gonna just check uh, chat for a second here. There's been quite a lot going on. <laughs> I can't believe a dev is hacking. True. True. Yeah, so people talking about how it's like an interesting case study for like large open source projects. I think that this is a super good point because when we're working at this scale with this many people, um, first of all, uh, very difficult to come to general consensus on things that are more controversial when it comes to either gameplay or design. Um, but for the most part, we don't tend to run into that too often. I feel like uh, Slip, you might have like a different opinion on that because you're a lot closer to a lot of this design type of stuff. Um, if I could, I'm gonna take, I'm gonna go AFK for like one minute, uh, one or two minutes, but if I could get you to uh, chat about that, that'd be pretty cool. I missed exactly what you were saying because I stupidly had Discord open and um, and Twitch open at the same time, yeah. and so I was hearing everything twice and didn't quite hear it. Um, but I think it was about like game design decisions. Yeah, like, like, yeah, like design decisions yeah. on like open source projects with like this many right. people sort of thing. Yep, yep, yep. Um, yeah, game design is definitely trickier um like there, like there are some difficulties to it that come from just trying to do everything kind of with a group consensus um we've used we've run through a couple different systems at first we were very disorganized about it 
um, we afterwards created like an official game design group um, that was supposed to come up with um, like different concepts and make real decisions. And, and we started doing like meetings to uh, like physical, like not physical, but um, actual voice meetings to try to come to consensuses on a lot of topics. Um, it's tricky because I would say as opposed to programming and most other areas of the game, game design is an area where like a lot of people are passionate about um, the types of decisions that we make in game as far as like progression goes and things like that because everybody sort of has their own background and games that they like games that they don't like systems that they like what they what they think works what they don't what doesn't work um what works for us really at the end of the day is is basically just talking through things for as long as possible um it it can be tough and it's and it's definitely like iterative and we run through the same discussions a lot it seems like at times like you can you can have the same discussion a hundred times in discord um but it does eventually get us to where we need to be just by like kind of continuing to hash things out and and running through um everybody's ideas over and over um there's a danger i would say in open source of sort of trying to make everybody happy um and continuing to like break down discussions until you just have like a solution that everybody is okay with because a lot of the times if you do the thing that everybody likes or that everybody that everybody is okay with but nobody loves i guess you you end up with sort of like these bland decisions that don't really commit to a specific area um and that might not like you know they they would be a lot less interesting in that way i think like one example would be like when we first created the game or when we first um, started kind of planning out the game, we made a poll for the different races that we wanted to see in the game. And some of the choices that you could have on that poll were like the standard like orc, um, you know, human, elf, whatever. And then there were a lot of more interesting things like um, like people that were like avians and like people that were like of nature and like druid type things and, and weird like interesting concepts that, that were cool. Um, and everybody liked a lot of the more interesting concepts, but of course the things that ended up winning the vote were just the standard like, you know, orc um undead blah, 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 all of those because at the end of the day when you when you just take a consensus when you're doing when you break down to a vote i guess you don't get as interesting of a result as you get when you have like kind of a few creative minds and so there's definitely a blend of like trying to get um everybody's input on things and getting everybody to agree to things and also trying to make sure that you don't lose track of like one artistic vision overall in that um in that mix. So yeah, in general, there's, in my experience, not exactly like a, a quick route to game design decisions. It's, there's a lot of, um, it's a very iterative process. It's something that we just kind of have to continue to talk through until we get to, until we find interesting solutions that are, um, that fit the game and that and that work in all the ways that we need them to mm -hmm, mm -hmm. i think something else i'll add on to that um so design is one part of like uh, the project and coming to consensus and everything like that but um we also see so many different systems as well that have like for example like the multiplayer is like very coding focused whereas maybe assets and design that one's a lot of uh art focus but also coding focus for like ui and stuff and then same with combat you have a lot of animation artistic kind of stuff uh, but then you also have a lot of code and so uh, the way that we break the, the project down internally we have like um several different working groups and uh we there's like a lead for each one and they focus on uh really making sure that just items in that system are taken care of and so i'm the meta lead and that sort of talks about all of the in between type of stuff so like the weekly blog um a lot of git and like continuous integration type of stuff um whereas slipped is the the leader of the animations um and so uh slip deals with a lot of different uh well actually wait, are you the animation leader or are you combat lead uh we don't technically have an animation group uh we have sam who runs combat um and then me and snow ram who do all the animations true 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 um yeah so uh um pretty much every so pretty much all the animations in the game um you've built out yourself like that the systems for it and everything like that right yeah a lot more from snow ram recently um the early stuff i would say was me and now we're pretty split 50 50. yeah 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 it's good to have the the systems in place for it um and like when it comes to your uh 
like your process of adding animations and designing them and stuff like that um like what what kind of approach do you take to to setting up like either new characters or new um enemies or anything like that um it's 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 helped definitely to like you said i guess get a lot of the pieces in place um especially after embers was able to add hot loading to the animations which let's just kind of load them in real time um in general i guess now it's it's easier now that we like i said we now we're sort of like we have i think a lot of the basics and we're just sort of blending between them and so like we'll have um you know you might have a, a, a two types of animals that are completely different but then when you and then when you add a new one they're sort of in between that and so you already start with like some of the baseline stuff that you need um i would say that in general our style kind of leans towards realism i guess as far as we can um while being in voxel like Gemu's models are like very detailed and they always pretty much try to i guess be true to like how an animal would look in real life and the the movement style is similar to that and that like we try to like cube world is a very um it it follows sort of a, a much more like cartoonish kind of stylized method i would say like it um like the leg just kind of moves in a pendulum and things like that when a character is running where we have like a um a few different systems that that kind of make it a little bit more interesting like we have this like stride system which basically like when a quadruped is running it'll start it in like a sort of um i forget what exactly what the different types of gates are called but like the you move like the left feet at the same time and then the right feet at the same time then eventually you get into like a cross stride and then like a full-blown like you know the front feet move and then the back feet move and like it like a like a full-blown sprint like that and so there are a couple of cool like um realistic ish systems that we're able to execute um from animation and um and we're getting there as far as like tooling goes like recently we added um like a couple versions of back i guess it was we added support for keyframes um which then got a lot better and became much easier to work with and now when we need to like add in different kinds of boss attacks and stuff like that it's usually pretty um very simple to do um which has been cool because at first like the game would not really have been able to support larger creatures like that like it was sort of um you know the bigger things get i guess the the tougher it gets to to kind of keep that um looking like to, to prevent it from looking like too fake and obnoxious but now like animations are a lot smoother than they used to be and so we can animate like bigger style things without just having too much visual issue which is neat yeah so we're moving on to, uh like snoring mask has a really cool like wyvern animation that's set to go that will probably go into a, a release very soon um and really like overwhelm bosses and stuff like that we're getting into like a lot of that type of cooler stuff <laughs> yeah it's uh I, I think definitely with a lot of these systems and stuff like that um is that the point where a lot yeah there's like as you mentioned you can sort of build up a lot of things one off another um, and then recently Zester just announced like the, the process to be able to go and do like plugins and stuff like that. And so I'm definitely super excited when we can get to the point where, um, well, first of all, we can have custom content that um, anybody's able to add in either some type of like workshop or something you can go download it from. Um, but also uh, I, I still want to explore the idea of like what a Valorant editor would look like. And so some type of way of like loading up um, some type of scene, you can see like a character, you can maybe edit some animations or I uh, like still do it in code, but just see it in real time, like what it's looking like. Um, and I'm sure that we've built a lot of tooling around this, but um, yeah, I think there's a lot of potential in the in the future for having this type of, uh, um, yeah, the editor that allows people to do whatever they need. I think it'd be cool. I'm just taking a look around, see if there's any questions. And Gmo can't TP, I lack admin command permissions, oof. Um. I like the I like the Valoran uh, stage, I like the Discord stage kind of thing. It's pretty cool. I do wish I could screen share because that would make it easy for uh, people to see what's actually going on instead of just Twitch. But it's still like a cool hangout podcast type of thing. I think. I'm surprised they haven't added that. It seems like a pretty basic feature. I guess maybe there are like bandwidth concerns and, and things like that associated yeah, with it. Yeah. But it seems like the logical, um, like a logical part part of it. Mm -hmm. Uh, in chat right now, we have a few other devs. Um, if any want to come in and chat about what kind of stuff you've been working on, it would be, I'd, I'd definitely be uh, interested in pulling you into the room. Uh, Christoph, it'd be cool to hear about some uh, economic stuff if you're down to uh, to join or um, 
I don't know. Uh, Sam, if you want to talk about combat or anything. Or... Is there a cap on how many secrets there can be at one time? I don't think so. Not that I know of. But not 100% sure on that. Hmm. Hmm. In Twitch chat, um, people are starting the uh, the discussions of uh, John Blow's rational mind Jai and like his opinions on Rust and stuff like that. Um, that's a very spicy topic. I do love talking about this type of thing. I love watching uh, John Blow just because uh, there's so much to learn from like what he's working on and stuff like that. Um, but he definitely has some pretty strong opinions about Rust um, and like where. Uh, it's useful or where it's like needed or anything like that um or rather like i suppose where um maybe as like a c++ developer you feel like you are getting uh uh handicapped because the borrow checker is forcing you to do so many um so many things to get stuff to compile but i think yeah so in, in uh chat zester's talking about how like our decision to use rust is uh um has turned out to be super, super useful. And I think that anybody who's done any development on the project can really um, attest to that in the sense that uh, we, we get the benefits of having a systems level programming language that allows us to do uh, concurrency super easily and gives us a lot of like, like a pretty strong entity component system paradigm to follow uh, for a lot of what we're doing. Um, and then on top of that also provide us guarantees. So like, for example, one of like one of the great things that it's not like a hundred percent guarantee with rust but it's like if your code compiles it's most likely going to run and so what that means is as long as we make sure that people's code compiles before merging it into into master um with like the rest of the code base then we're pretty certain that they're not gonna like it's, it's not gonna mess up um something else now this is like a very generalized statement it doesn't work in every case um but it allows us to move forward very quickly without having to um worry too much about regressions um and overall not have to worry as much about um, like our own unit testing, um, just because it, it, if it compiles, like, it, like there's like a super strong type system and uh, you're gonna make sure that um, like a lot of the errors that you tend to have that would crash a program, uh, whether it be memory related or just um, type related or anything, uh, those are all handled and enforced at compile time. Um, so I, if anybody else here, uh, any of the other devs, if you guys have any insights on, uh, on using Rust for like some of the stuff that you've been doing, like, is there anything that like, as like a systems language, as a games language is like sort of allowed you to do differently or anything? So you mentioned, um, about like if it compiles and it works and, uh, not needing to use, uh, tests as much. But actually, one of the strengths that Rust does have is that it has a built-in testing uh, framework that you just annotate a function with uh, like sharp square bracket test, uh, and then like cargo test will like automatically detect it and run it. And then we have like the GitLab CI that like makes sure that those tests run before any code makes it to master. Um, so that's a benefit on top of uh, like the type system of borrow check. Yeah, yeah. So that, that's definitely a pretty big one. Um, and that being said, I think I think our coverage is like like six ish percent or something like that. Which means that of all of the code in the code base, all like about three hundred thousand lines of code, uh, probably like two hundred fifty thousand lines of Rust. Um, of all of that, five or six percent of it, it has like tests that will go and run that code. Um, so it's not showing up right now, but I think that it's around that much. Um, and so that granted, like. So I'm not. I'm definitely not trying to say that like uh, we we shouldn't have tests or there's not good places for tests. But tests can be a lot more general in our case. And so, uh, for example, we don't need to like in Python. I might write a test that makes sure that when I pass a piece of data to a function, I get like the expected data back in like the same format that I'm expecting or something like that. Um, but with like a strong type system, um, you're you're enforcing a lot of this stuff by just making sure that everything is the proper type. And so the type that I pass in is a type that will, uh, well, I mean, you could make it a different type that comes back out, but um, like you, you just have guarantees around that type of thing. And so um, what I would like to do in the future is have um, some like unit tests, or sorry, not unit tests, but integration tests, like something that will like boot up the game and then get like um, a lot of different uh, things happen. So maybe 
uh, like one example of uh, an end-to-end -end integration test would be like you have a character and you tell them to like um, start here and then they have to end here and they have to do pathfinding and you want to make sure that that pathfinding takes like like less than five seconds or something like that. And as long as it takes less than five seconds um, and like it, it works on like the the test, then as soon as something happens that will prevent that from working, then that integration test will fail and you can go look at why. Um, uh, like that's happening. So maybe you, like you change like gravity or something and now it can't climb up a wall. Um, that's all right. You're not gonna have a, gre a regression in game because then uh, you'll be able to take a look at um, or like you catch that ahead of time. And so that like, for example, that type of thing wouldn't be caught until someone in either someone played it and saw it or um, uh, yeah, so I, I, either before someone like went and played it or saw it or it was like on the main server. That example actually is something that we could probably do using uh, Rust's test framework by uh, just like setting up a, a small ECS world containing like just the terrain to pathfind around and um, like just the agent that's doing the pathfinding and then running, I think just the physics system, just the physics system and the agent system and the character behavior system and like maybe whatever those depend on. Uh, but we could run like basically a subset of the game in an integration task. Yeah, and so uh, I'm not entirely sure how all of like the this like you can like sort of like get some systems to run. But I think when with the entity component system, you can really um, very easily say I want this system and this system and this system to be running, um, and to to give it some type of base to uh, yeah to, like to to do this. And then and then when you write in the test, um, it's able to it just does it through data it doesn't care about like that that front end so yeah, i suppose that's a good point you don't necessarily have to have like blur and stuff running uh like for example um there's um i think uh, carlos and sharp are working on adding uh, more uh, unit tests to trade and part of that involves creating like a mock world with two entities that just have an inventory and that's all that's needed for the tests with the trade code to go through you don't need like the rest of the components, the rest of the uh, systems. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, I, I and I think we, we have some examples of this in the sense of like, if you want to load into like a super base world or something like that, um, you can always. Uh, I, I think we have like some type of example that doesn't do world gen; it just gives you like a flat world. So maybe if you need to do testing like for your own stuff on that, then um, like so we we do have that functionality in place. Um, but it's not being used uh, to its fullest potential yet, I think. Shouldn't it just all NPC types? Uh, wait, where? Uh, in the village I am, there are no more NPCs, <laughs> and there's a lot of loot lying on the ground. Did someone just uh, do something? That's very I'm interesting. For my good merchant. Yeah, it looks like just humans left here. I think. Interesting. Or, or just some human decided to, to kill everyone in this village. Yeah. I'm, I'm not sure because there's no safe zone. Okay, thanks. Oh, good. Uh, Christoph, if you want, I'll pull you in now to uh, chat a little bit about economics and stuff like that. I think uh, if I invite to speak, there you go. Hey, perfect. Hello, hello. Hello. So uh, I think, I mean, I've written a, a lot of, or edited a lot of the blog posts recently where you've kind of dove into a lot of the economics and stuff, but do you want to kind of just explain like the importance of it and how it works with uh, trading or different villages and everything like that? Yeah, maybe I just uh, start with a uh, historical uh, overview. <laughs> it all started with uh, actually me having uh, my inventory full and wanting to find something more meaningful than just throwing all the not less interesting things away. So I decided, well, uh, let's attack uh, selling things to um, actually merchants in the um, villages. And um, then Zester actually exposed me or introduced me to the um, economical simulation in the game. Uh, later on, I found that there was actually, uh, by accident, there was two different copies of the economical simulation, one um, outdated and one active one. Oh, actually, both were active, but one uh, new one and one outdated. And so it all started uh, with uh, yeah, just trying to shoehorn uh, um, uh, actually the need. It, it, um, at that point, 
economy sim was very easy. It actually it had five different goods, something like that, and five different professions. So basically, the economic simulation was just about uh, creating food and uh, sustaining the um, population in a village. Mm -hmm. um, and if you want to sell things you find in a dungeon to uh, a village, you actually have to get some numbers on uh, uh, weapons and on armor. So how do I introduce weapons and armor into a meaningful uh, value system? I actually create some need for it. Um, and so I just introduced uh, uh, the fact that to gather resources from the um, area around the city, you would need to control it. So you would actually have to have some guards which can um, actually um, control the uh, uh, fields and so we ended up with actually having the difference between resources which are there and resources which we have access to and this led to um, sort of uh, meaningful numbers for um, armor and weapons hmm. uh, and then <laughs> a lot of time passed and the game got, just got more and more complex yeah and I was unable to ca um, actually keep up with um, economy. Um, there is an ongoing effort to just make economy faster by just replacing the uh, large amount of maps which are used in the economy by um, arrays. Mm. Because the keys into these uh, maps are perfectly known at compile time and they are constant. Oh, interesting. Um, and this one is just much, much faster by um, let's say roughly a factor of eight mm. uh, but unfortunately it just uh, I saw that there was less population in the town so I know that there's some problem there <laughs> and interesting, I'm currently interesting. still debugging that for some weeks now yeah yeah and so I, as like so it, it, the end goal of this type of system is to allow uh, cities to be able to have economic value and trade uh, different goods and stuff, but then also will it feed into like the the world generation system? So like um, I think Cester was doing work at one point to like discover which villages were maybe like more because they're close to certain resources they can uh, like sustain themselves better and so they grow into a larger village. Um, does your system play into that at all? Uh, right now the um, world generation is not connected to economy, but uh, of course we want to add that. Um, and it's especially interesting once you actually get into different types of economies. For example, in a, um, a desert zone, you actually have a different economy than in a, um, um, a, a very uh, fertile zone. And um, actually within ice, all these economies work differently and they work on different resources. And it would really be nice to actually have these different economies actually playing into which type of goods you can actually buy there and which type of armor uh, the people wear there and things mm. like that. So we're working on getting uh, actually the economy values as an input to the generation of the sites. Interesting, interesting, interesting. Yeah, I think that's going to be super cool when some of these systems can work together um, like in, in that way. Because uh, I, I think that's really what makes or it will give us like the, the way to to say that this game is like like has like a lot of stuff that's pretty similar to a, like dwarf fortress type of uh setup and stuff like that have you ever have you ever like, do you have much experience with dwarf fortress or unfortunately none <laughs> <laughs> all good yeah and the uh, interesting or uh, actually the difficult part about the economy is that it just uses a totally different um Wares system or totally different wares which are um, traded between these sites than the items which are in game. So we actually need a, a mapping between the in-game items and the wares which are actually traded within this economy simulation. And this is uh, the cause for most of the uh, economy bugs which you encounter. Interesting. Yeah, I, I do. I mean, having read a lot of your uh, your write-ups, there's definitely a, a lot to these systems. It's no it's no easy task. When it works, it's just a lot of fun, and when it doesn't work, it's just <laughs> looking at numbers for days. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But uh, actually, there's also some interesting ideas about uh, um, simulating control to um, 
areas uh, between the sides so actually having some sort of warfare um, about um, economical um, interesting uh, areas mm. and this has become so much more feasible with the new um, economy uh, no with the new um, uh, location uh, system which James introduced uh, location like based on sites or actually there is something um, there's a long discussion <laughs> I believe from two weeks ago, or it might actually be four weeks uh, with Lester, um, when he talked about how to actually um, how to s actually how to start with economy in a world which has no idea about sides and yeah. you actually have just uh, economic units, which is basically um, uh, an area of terrain enclosed by a river or by mountains or whatever. So these uh, points of interest. And then you would just simulate from there, and then naturally, actually, uh, settlements would grow from there. So in my yeah. world, the economy would just be simulated during world generation. Yeah. Oh, I, I, I think it, that's like the, yeah, that's, a, that's a pretty good uh, is it goal. Is it possible to use the same algorithms for simulation than for later gameplay? For sure. Um, actually, the um, economical simulation, all these uh, prices, and uh, no, <laughs> it's more uh, more complicated. Actually, there is um, labor allocation, and this labor allocation is mostly based on um, uh, the need for specific goods. And then you can just, uh, from the availability of specific goods and the um, amount of labor which actually goes into these um, goods, uh, some sort of um, economic value is actually prices are calculated. Hmm. Yeah, and I think the the point about um, like the the world size and stuff like that, and so like the, the idea with Valoran is that if we take a look at the map, the, the map is finite. It doesn't go past here. You you can generate larger maps, but because we need to know um, things about the like the world inside. So for example. Um, maybe a town over here needs to know about a town over here so it can do stuff like history, design, and um, any like trading or economic or anything like that. Um, however, if a town over here, uh, if there was like just a town over here that hadn't been generated or anything like that, then this town wouldn't have the proper information to be able to, uh, to deal with it. And so uh, the way that we solve it is we have a finite sized map um, that, that is still quite large. Um, and uh, I'm assuming like um, depending on a lot of optimization in the future, like uh, parts of it can like either be made like larger or smaller. Um, but we do need to have like a, a bound. So, and, and that being said, like if we didn't care about a lot of this stuff and we just wanted terrain generation, like the terrain generation itself could, well, actually, basic terrain generation, like Minecraft terrain generation can go on infinitely, um, like to the size of very like whatever size variables can hold uh because of the fact that it's just uh noise like perlin noise or whatever that can be generated for whatever like value of x and y that you have but for ours like i, I suppose another reason that we can't have it infinite is i think our erosion systems require a finite sized world and so like the erosion that made uh this mountain the way that it is um it needs to know stuff about the stuff that's like left to it right to it up to down and stuff like that um and so uh as you get to the edges like i mean games might solve this by just having like you in this massive valley that you can't escape out of or that you're not allowed to leave or something like that but we just have an ocean that i i i don't know actually with the ocean i'm right in, right in the middle so i won't try to go to it um i think you can just like move in a direction forever um i don't think oh, there's anything to stop you. <laughs> oh yeah uh, yeah, so in, until computer stuff won't let you. In, in the same way that with Minecraft, you can build above 255. Um, but our, our number is much larger than that. Oh, that's, that's stuck in an air so tree. The, so the erosion simulation, I think, generates a height map. And I think you could just, if you had a way to just keep sampling from an arbitrarily large uh, height map, you might be able to just lazily sample more chunks. But I guess beyond a certain point, like the mountains would be like less interesting because of not having a proper erosion simulation, which does require like a that you fix the map size ahead of time. Yeah, yeah. Oh no, I'm stuck in the world again. Oh no. 
Well, if you wanted to see what's under the world, there's uh, an interesting mountain. We have this pretty cool uh, infinite black hole here. I think if I zoom out much further, yeah, look at that. It goes down to infinity. Ooh. Eventually, we'll put a cap on how far you can scroll out, but that time is not now. If you scroll out far enough. Okay, actually, I won't, uh, that was a bad idea. I apologize to anybody watching that. So if you turn off the uh, clouds and scroll all the way out, you can see like the entire world map as LOD terrain. Oh yeah, let's do that. So I think we, maybe we should like cap zooming out like way far like past the world, but we should probably keep being able to scroll out to see the entire world as LOD terrain because like that showcases engine features really well. Yeah, yeah. So I think, yeah, one, some of the things that here are, are cool is like our reflective water, like that, that, like, so reflective water in LOD. And so no matter how far a lake is like away from you, um, like you'll be able to see the reflection of whatever the sky would have um, for it. Um, and then similarly, like, yeah, like if, if I zoom out, this is, this is the size of the map, uh, which definitely loses a lot of its uh, magic once you turn off clouds and you can do this. Um, I mean, like one, one feature that I, or one interaction that I would love to to see, um, I don't know if, it, if, if we have plans for anything, is like the ability, like as you scroll out, as soon as you scroll past a certain point, it just scrolls like it scrolls you to the world map. Um, I've had that in a few different games, and I love that type of uh, that type of thing. How do I TP up a little bit? TP move uh, slash jump zero zero, and then whatever your Z. Thank you. All right, let's turn clouds back on and get some of this magic back. Ooh, ultra clouds. Oh, very cool. All right, I was going in an easterly direction. There we go. I'll come with some risk five and x86 in uh, Twitch chat. Very cool. I don't know if there's anything from uh, VC related going on. Wait, no, I'm, I'm trying to. So recently, uh, oh, is everybody just hanging it around the giant tree? Uh, so Zester added some uh, uh, like giant tree code. Actually, no, it was Zester and CC Gauche, I think. Um, that was uh, some pretty cool stuff. And I apologize. Well, how many people? I don't want to ask this to lady people. Okay, I'm not going to keep trying to change it today. Um, so you can't. Actually, no, I'll do it. I'll do it. Time done. There we go. That won't ruin it too much for people. Yeah, so the giant trees are super cool, um, and it, this is kind of just like showing off like like the, the procedural generation that can uh, that can happen, or like uh, like I suppose like when you build in rules for this type of stuff, um, and like the potential for having, uh, yeah. So, so when it comes to procedural generation, you, you do want to like a decent amount of like emergent type of stuff, and so. Um, for example, like with the, the mountains that we have and the towns that get generated, uh, you want the towns to like, be generated in like an interesting way um, in the mountain, like have a reason to be there and um, to not be there in an unexpected way um, or not, not expected, but like to just look like they're copy and pasted there or something like that. And so um, similarly, it'd be cool to walk up to giant tree and see that there's uh, like a village um, like built into it or something like that. And um but I, I think it's more, it, it, gets, it gets very difficult once you're uh, trying to get some very specific stuff going on um, uh, because you do have to like write the code for you how each uh, um, each type of thing that gets that gets added. Uh, Dafferlinx asked, what would you guys say are the big features of this update? So I think um, just a few that I know of that are like sort of background stuff. So one of the big ones um, is the WGPU merge and so that's like changing over the the, the graphics um api that we're using so that we can support vulcan uh like the, the vulcan api um which means that at the moment we I, I think that that means we don't support as many cards from like the 2010 era per se 
Um, but then we do get like a lot more power with the uh, um, the more modern uh, frameworks and stuff. Uh, but anybody else here have any uh, major things that they know about uh, that were put in? So did we discuss the uh, boss reworks yet? I think that was after 0.9. Yeah, I don't think we've talked about them yet. Uh, Slip, were you part of that at all? Uh, a little bit, yeah. I think everything after Mind Flare was uh, part of 0 0.10, which is... um. What are the names? There's the Minotaur. Wait, there are um, six different tiers of dungeons, and I think five of them at this point are reworked. Like, like originally the bosses just kind of got dropped in as assets, and they had like a generic like non-attack. Um, and Sam has been going through and fixing them all to be like very unique. And now they all they all have like very interesting kind of layered fights. Like, um, like Minotaur runs around and has like a huge charge that he comes after you with, um, and like a big buff that like I think it's called like Fury or something, where he's like harder to fight in the second half. Um, there's a Yeti who throws snowballs and <laughs> they're like kind of like creates a minefield of snowballs. Um, there's Tidal Warrior, which is like a huge lobster guy who chops totems that like uh, do knockback on the field, and you have to like to destroy those totems before they kind of take over the environment. Um, and then last is the, the clay golem, which is in the tier, I think, three dungeons or four dungeons, um, which have like laser eyes and do like, and, like a big uh, melee attack and uh, something else that I forget. But yeah, I guess the point is, is that we're, we're starting to get to a point where I think like all the, the fights are like becoming really interesting, which is cool. And you have to like definitely um, learn what you're fighting against with the bosses before you can really get good at it and be able to beat them consistently. So there's definitely like a learning curve that we're kind of adding. Yeah, and I think to add on to that, when I was in the boss fight earlier uh, with everybody, um, it is really crazy to see like the sort of different phases that a boss will go through and um, so, uh, yes, yeah, so, like sort of react more to the players around them. I think what one thing that we had um, for a long time that really like made Lauren feel like a tech demo is that um, attacks and stuff always felt very one to one. And so you'd hit, they'd hit, you'd hit, they'd hit. Whoever has the more damage per whatever hit um, would be the would be the victor or whoever has the most health or whatever. Um, but now with all these different ways of fighting and the fact that you're going to go in there with like several uh, friends or something like that. Um, yeah, it's, it's a lot more dynamic, I feel. And so um, definitely in this update, I've, uh, I, yeah, I've felt a lot of those changes and stuff like that. Um, from Zester, Zester mentioned uh, new physics and new gliding. Yeah, so this is a big one. So I'm uh, uh, just flying around this giant tree over here. And uh, like as you can see with the with the glider, um, it used to be pretty standard glider. Like you, you play a glider in a video game, you can move, you kind of move forward, but um, it, it doesn't really take in like proper physics or anything like that into consideration. But with like the the new physics update and like the the way that it helps handle buoyancy in uh, the airships and uh, like just general movement in general, um, kinematics around the world and stuff like that. Um, like the, the benefit like when, when we're flying with this uh with the glider here like so much work has been put in into making this like a pretty fun experience to to fly around like um i, I mean like i've definitely i actually so maybe there are some games that have really invested in physics like this but like as you're flying and like you like feel like you're, you're being pulled around a bit but then i like change my mouse over to the other side and i can like look down and go faster and uh it, it, like it just feels so smooth to 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 ride with and so it's definitely a uh, like that that was one of the biggest ones uh, that i like when, when i saw so when i saw this the first time like the, the first prototype of this type of glider like it blew my mind it was like it was some podcast that was talking about Valoran, and they had like a video of the glide actually no wait i i think that they were showing off the video of the glider and that was the first time i had seen it for whatever reason um but it, it was just amazing um so yeah also npc ai improvements uh item crafting overhaul uh, a lot more items in the world um, yeah, boss battles improved as well. Um, One-handed weapons. Um, yeah, so definitely like a lot of stuff that's added to like you as a player when you're going around and doing combat and when you're um, exploring the world, uh, like really enhancing that experience. I think to be critical though, there's definitely um, like the one big point that we've been missing for a lot of versions um, is like 
the 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 reason to, to do things in the world and so this comes from my like, questing and story and stuff like that and so this has been something that's always been on our plate but um it hasn't come to fruition just yet but i think we're definitely approaching a place that we have enough information about the the world and like what we call sites in the world so if i open my ui and just go to mini map um and, and activate all these um i'm pretty sure there's more sites than just this but um every item in here there's like a lot of data about um what each one is and so like uh like within the village there's like uh like a lot more information about like the economics and stuff built into that right now whereas on the other hand maybe something like the giant tree is um considered a site for the purpose of like an object being there um but it doesn't have like the same type of like extra metadata as like the well not really metadata like extra just information as, as the village does yeah there's also a really cool new system for sound detection where npcs are actually able to react to sound and so i think our um our sound output our like sound outcomes right now are kind of limited i think it's mostly just attacks but like if you you can you could you've always been able to like sneak around in dungeons and stuff but now if you actually like, attack um enemies will like react to that noise and then they'll like come over and and see what's going on and fight or whatever which um which is is cool right now and has like a ton of potential to add to like um a lot of really interesting and like emergent outcomes once we do a lot more with it um like as far as like distracting npcs and, and using all different kinds of tactics i think yeah I, I remember when i um first heard about like elder scrolls online like they, they described the system in which uh different npcs um depending on the context of battle could like work together in like more um ai intelligent ways to to know that like if one of them like has more health than the rest then it should be the one that like goes and runs in front where the other one stay back and stuff like that and like these type of systems um have definitely been like i found them quite interesting for like npcs to have this type of uh information about the the battles and stuff and make the fights feel a lot more dynamic rather than just everything running up to you and doing its best to kill you while, while not caring about the fact that it's going to die in one hit or whatever and so i think that there's definitely a lot of room for experimentation kind of um uh yeah seeing what's out there and making these battles feel like a lot different especially like with uh everybody who's been working on making the uh, the visual parts of battle look so great um yeah there's a uh, Lots of interesting stuff there, for sure. Um, so I think it's currently the case with the sound system um, that it's just that uh, like dungeon enemies will react to like explosions and arrows, and they'll so that um, if you're in one room and you're using uh, a staff, and there's uh, enemies in the next room, they'll be drawn towards uh, the room that you're in by the noise. Um, but it would be cool to be using that for. Um, like teamwork between uh the, between like the villagers and the guards for example if the um villagers yelling that they're being attacked uh weren't just a speech bubble but were reflected into this system such that the guards could be drawn towards the villagers mm -hmm. uh, and i think i think holy chowders is uh, working on that next yeah yeah there's definitely uh, a lot of different yeah, types of ai and stuff that are being implemented and i think that what what you want as a player or the experience that you want to give to a player is that they go in and are surprised by interactions that um that are going on and so for example like if someone doesn't follow our blog or anything like we, we definitely talk about a lot of the behind the scenes but if you go in and play it then it's really great for you to be surprised by interactions that you wouldn't expect in the game and to also further um if you don't understand what the ai um so you can see what it's doing, but if you don't understand how it's working, then it allows you as a player to become far more uh, immersed because um, you can only speculate uh, how it would try to do what it's doing. And in that case, you as like the imaginative person who doesn't know how it works will come up with like these uh, amazing, um, fantastical AI behavior brains that they must have to uh, to be able to, to do all of this. And so, um, yeah, I think... Uh, um, yeah, there's there's a lot of work that a lot of people on the team are super like that are that are doing that are super that's pretty cool. Um, we have a question chat. Any plans to port Valorant into WebAssembly? Um, yeah, so I think uh, with WGPU it should be a lot easier. Um, so Zester is mentioning that we look at um, porting to Lauren first uh, because it's like a super easy way to not have to worry about all of the. Uh, yeah, I suppose like the fact that we have like 700 crates that we're using that may or may not have difficulties. Um, 
Yeah, okay, and then Zestra also mentions like this this term is like uh, called projection. So once AI goes past the threshold of intelligence, people start uh, projecting intelligence that it doesn't exist um, onto them. And so uh, I think, I, I don't remember the exact anecdote, but a long time ago in uh, AI research or video game or something, there was a video game that came out and it had the idea of um, uh, like you're shooting enemies and then like these AI enemies would like run behind cover or something like that. But there was some type of bug where the AI um, wouldn't always do the right thing. And so maybe it would like not, it would like come out of cover or it didn't like go between this like finite state machine properly or something like that. And because it had this erratic behavior that the player wasn't expecting, um, then the players projected a ton of different um, like intelligent abilities onto it. And they thought it was just like the most advanced AI ever because it was doing these um, th these pretty crazy things. And so, yeah, it's, uh, um, and then Zester also mentioned this happens a lot with Dwarf Fortress. And so, yeah, um, with all the functionality that's built into it, um, when you see, uh, I, I don't know of any like specific examples, but, um, you just see emergent behavior from your dwarves that you wouldn't expect. Um, or you, you I mean, like so from the outside, if you hear the story that, um, uh, I, I don't remember exactly how it goes, but like a, a cat can uh, get drunk and die of alcohol poisoning or something like that just because like the systems allowed it to walk in and then get beer on his fur and then uh, uh, like like in its ability to like lick his fur. Like, um, and I'm, I'm sure someone else can tell it a lot better, but uh, that you, you hear that type of thing and you're like, it must be like so infinitely complex, like the, the logic behind this game. But there's a lot of tricks that you can use to have these types of th like crazy things happen without too much uh too much overhead uh capucho asked um how feasible would it be to make 140 megabyte game run in a browser i think this is a pretty good question so uh with we learn the size oh god there's a boss here <laughs> who spawned that so it must have been sam or try hard i don't know i i mean i i have a lot of health and so i'm not gonna die but um what was i saying oh yeah so with, with like our binary the binary is about 60 megabytes for voxygen so just like our main game and then we have like another 100 ish megabytes of assets i think that there's a lot that can be done to make this a lot smaller um and so whether it be like what we're shipping in the binary um what we're optimizing for the binary um what we are uh shipping as assets um there, there's a lot that can be done in the, in that area. Um, and so I do, and then further, um, in the future, it'd be really cool if we can cache a lot of this stuff a lot differently. Uh, one thing that I was interested in that I don't have all of the, the insight into, but when, when you have a binary, um, and maybe with WebAssembly, it's a little bit different, but um, when you update certain parts of it, uh, I think that there's a like there's levels of modularity that you can like sort of hot fix a binary, and so um, because like it's, it's expecting a function call uh, to go to somewhere in this binary file, you can just swap out that function call to be like a new version of it. And I'm sure that there's um, a lot of research around this, and I'm very naive about it. But I think that um, when it comes to updating stuff, you definitely don't need to update uh, the the full 140 megabytes every single time. Uh, I'm so busy. I'll leave that open as I read chat here. I'd suggest not trying to port Voxygen and instead trying to write an alternative front end. Um, okay, yeah, so interesting. So for the fact that uh, Voxygen itself is like super designed to run as a computer application in comparison to um, yeah, being WGPU or like a web assembly front end. I mean, our protocol is known and open source, so mm -hmm. people can just, if they want to have like their port on VGPU, they can just port their own um, front end, so to say, like with Teloren or, or Bot client. Mm -hmm. And they can maybe also write something which is like for the web, like as a web page, so rather than have like. Front end game. Yeah, and so to, to sort of elaborate on that, um, it, it, it just like to describe a little bit more, the idea is that our protocol to talk with the multiplayer server like it, is open source and people can look at it and stuff. And so it's just as feasible. Like if you're going to rewrite it, you could just make like a Unity game that learned how to interpret the, or like you, you wrote it to interpret what the backend is setting back and forth. And then 
you instead of loading in like a vo uh, a voxel world you you made it just like a um like real meshes or something like that and so um i mean there there, there is potential for that but uh keeping it in rust is uh definitely what allows it to be so optimized for for specifically what we're doing so regarding the network protocol and like interoperability with other implementations that's actually something where we're like leveraging a, a feature that's like relatively unique to rust the uh CRD, um derived macros for serialize and deserialize uh so the the network messages are just rust enums that contain like a list of uh, what messages to expect mm -hmm. um, and the the derived macros automatically create uh, serialization and deserialization code for that and then i think we're uh, serializing those as a uh, data code um which um we could then like serialize as json or something so that it's um easier to read from other languages um but they would but an alternate implementation would still need to import the definitions of like which uh messages it should be like expecting and accepting mm -hmm. um so it's easiest for additional clients to be written in rust yeah uh, just to interrupt with that yeah I, I do like that method quite a lot of just having every type of message that you could send as in uh, enum that you can um just have like a list of and then as long as you're pulling with the current version of uh, that spec, then uh, you're good to go. I like that type of thing quite a lot. Uh, additionally, um, I guess uh, regarding the thing that uh, we discussed like a while ago about like the lack of tests, um, the pattern match like exhaustivity checking, just ensuring that we're matching all variants of an enum, uh, is actually one of the things that guarantees that like if you add a new message uh, in the uh, in the server. Uh, you can't forget to uh, handle it in the client because it won't compile if you're not handling all the cases. Yeah, absolutely. And I think this is one of like the, the super powerful things. I, I've been doing some game dev in uh, C Sharp recently, and it, it has of recent introduced some type of pattern matching that does provide these um, compile time guarantees a little bit. But like, um, I mean, using a lot of C Sharp makes me miss, miss a lot of things in Rust. Um, but uh, yeah, that, that idea of... Um, when you so an, the idea of an enum is like let's say like we have five different messages that we want to pass from the server to the client and so like one of them's like move one of them's attack one of them um is like craft something one of them is uh, talk with someone and one of them's like log out um that means that if we were to add a new one the, the sixth one that's like login a login message then if we only add the logic to it to the server then the game won't compile because it's expecting um that this enum is handled and that the client knows how to handle it and then only once the client is uh saying like okay like we're pattern matching on it we, we've handled everything that's there only then will will it compile and so that this this is one of the reasons like, so let's say like we forgot to do that and then um we we're uh, playing the game and we're on the uh, on the client and then it just receives that message from the server and it doesn't know what handle ha how to handle it then we'd either have to have something that is like oh this is a problem it's not doing what we're supposed to or um in in depending on how you do it you might have something that just crashes or anything like that but um so that, that's sort of like one of the the benefits of like these uh types of guarantees that you can get from uh from the server are oh, we doing fireworks one sec uh dusk time and dusk. One, twenty, one twenty. Okay, okay, prick, 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 prick. Okay, so this is, is, is this doing it to everybody else's screen too, where it just switches between, um, like different daytimes right now, or is it just mine? I might need to restart the server. I think I fricked this up. I, I found this when I was doing single player earlier. Uh, me too. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. So I was doing this in your single player earlier, which is a cool effect to have because it gives you different stuff. But I can't uh, undo this. Um, and so we might have to restart the server, <laughs> or we can just have it always I've flashing never seen between this, huh? Because hmm. I, I just assumed that time twenty would change it to a uh, that time of day. Oh, did you change it to wait? Time twenty. Yeah. Not time twenty colon oh. Yeah. Yeah. Just time twenty. 
So you set it to, I think, 20 seconds after the epoch instead of the next occurrence of uh, 20 o'clock. Uh, wait, so if I if I just do 20 o'clock, would that be good? Yeah, if you, um, because I don't, sure. I don't think this fixed it last time. <laughs> I think other people are finding it too. Uh, you can try a time of some large number of nines to see if it, if it will like advance forward in time. I don't know if there's a way to... Wait, is it fixed now? Is it fixed? It might be fixed. It looks... Okay, it looks fixed. It looks fixed. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So wait, explain what happened there then. Because like, if you do it 20 seconds after the epoch, why does it have so many issues? Is it just mod? It's probably just modding. Because you're rewinding time. Oh, and it just the you server can't keep up. Backwards in time. No, you set time backwards in time, and then it's like I think trying to interpolate to that. Uh, I don't know whether the interpolation depends on time being like monotonic or anything. But the way it normally works, um, I think Zester changed this semi recently. Um, is that the like. When you specify setting the time to a certain hour, it goes forward to the next instance of that hour so that it doesn't have problems with uh, non monotonic time. Yeah. Uh, Sam said that he fixed it by just spamming time night a lot of times. Man. Yeah, cause I, yeah, I forgot that I did that earlier. I just wanted to set it to like 20 o'clock so we can see the fireworks, but this works too. Thank you very much, Sam, for saving the day. You love to see it. All right, I think I'll probably, uh, okay, yeah, we just went over two hours on the on the stream here. I'll probably wrap it up in the next few minutes uh, just because I want to go pass out because my brain is very mush right now. Um, but uh, anything else that any of the other uh, devs here want to say or just chime in about before we, before we bounce? If not, we'll just uh, end with some fireworks here. That's a lot. This is a, an impressive amount of fireworks. I, I am pretty surprised that... Okay, this... this I'm, I'm really surprised that like the, the game can handle it this well. It's a lot of particles. Yeah, so each uh, firework has a chance to spawn uh, two more fireworks, but the expected number of fireworks is less than one, so it <laughs> doesn't end up like exponentially replicating and uh, ending up with more fireworks than you started. Yeah. Yeah, it's showing, it was showing, I think it was like 350,000 particles on screen at most. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, true. And so, okay, I, actually, just diving into this a little bit, um, is the particle type of stuff, is this, uh, like, based on the entity component system? Anybody know? Uh, yes. Uh, so particles... Uh, themselves or the fireworks? Mm, so I think the fireworks, particles. um, there's a, a match on object type, so you'll see the uh, yellow sparks trailing the firework. That's reading the ECS system. Um, mm -hmm. But the actual firework itself, there's an outcome that's sent when the firework explodes, which is uh, just a single instant. I see. That's super cool. But basically, yeah, it, it reads the ECS system since the outcome is actually uh, are one of the uh, what's the term for it? Resource in the ECS system. Yeah, yeah. And so, like, when it's calculating any of like the um, physics or anything on it, um, like if you have so many of them working at the same time, um, like, are we getting like some pretty big benefits from using it within an ECS? Um, less sure in performance, but it's just easier to read from the ECS usually. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Since the, the client has its own world for that. Oh, yeah, that's true. That's true. Yeah, it's not server side that cares, I guess. Mm -hmm. Well, like, stuff is synced ser through the server to the client, but yeah, it's not yeah. like it copies the entire thing over to the client. It just updates, yeah. it, basically. Yeah, exactly, exactly. All right. So the fireworks themselves are normal entities with, like, bodies and positions, and that's how it's, like, detected when they've uh, reached the peak and should detonate. Uh, like that's a uh, system that iterates over all of the um, uh, over all of the entities with I think object bodies and handles um, uh, handles the case of like fireworks and bombs and like maybe one other thing. Mm, okay.
All right. I think uh, I'm going to end the Twitch stream here. So thank you, uh, anybody who came out and checked out the uh, the launch party, um, the release party here. Well, yeah, much more release than launch. Release party. Um, yeah, I think we peaked at about 125, and we seem, seem to not have any problems with the, with the server, which is very promising for uh, um, the next releases if we, uh, if we have more than we've reached before. And so... Um, yeah, I'll see everybody. Uh, oh, yeah, the, the link to Discord, if you're, on, if you're on Twitch, link to the Discord is probably in the channel somewhere. I don't know everything about Twitch, but I think it's there. Um, and we'll see you for the next release.